joy it is to be here with all of you from different parts of the planet, assembled here in Woods Hole, to talk about one of the best places on the planet. This view is something that those of us around on the planet today pretty much take for granted. But when I was a kid, this view did not exist. Google did not exist. Cell phones did not exist. Laptops did not exist. A lot of things did not. But there were things around when I was a kid that now are gone. Huh. We live at a time of extraordinary change. I mean, you know that. But I hope you really know that. I hope you appreciate that never before has there been a time as critically important as the time we now all share. Two years ago, I had a chance to dive into the mountains of Switzerland to go to the World Economic Forum, where, surprise, surprise, they were talking about the ocean. Huh. Not for the first time, but for the first time it had more focus than usual. And I had a chance, actually, to give five presentations about how the ocean and people everywhere, what we care about, are linked together. The economy, our health, security, but mostly life itself. For me, huh, my passion for the ocean, I think began, well, early on, on the coast of the Jersey Shore. But as a kid, I read William Beebe's book, Half Mile Down. And if you haven't dived into that book yourself, it would be fun to do so, especially with your perspective, to imagine looking over William Beebe and Otis Barton's shoulders when, for the first time, the first humans glimpsed what life is like as much as half a mile <coughs> beneath the surface, where it's dark all of the time, except for the living light of the creatures who make their own light. Ha, huh, can you imagine cramming yourself into a little steel ball lowered over the side like a fish on a line? <laughs> and looking out that tiny little porthole and seeing that it isn't just water, it's a living soup. It's like a minestrone. But all the little creatures, all those little bits of minestrone <coughs> are swimming around. Imagine being the first to see things of this sort. Well, now, those of you who've been out to that place on the planet, the Sargasso Sea, where William Beebe and Otis Barton made their historic first plunge into the depths, you, you know a lot more than Beebe and Barton knew at the time, and certainly more than the first scientists who explored the ocean globally for the first time, the Challenger Expedition, 1872. There are others who explored the ocean long before then, but to go with a scientist's eye, to ask questions, to do what little kids do, if they're any kind of kid at all, like scientists, if they're any kind of scientist at all, you just ask questions, who, what, why, where, when, how, laced with a great sense of wonder curiosity. It took a while for me to actually get to the Sargasso Sea myself, or to get into a submarine myself, but I have enjoyed thousands of hours underwater, using now more than 30 variations on the theme of little submarines that would make Bibi and Barton sigh with envy, I'm sure. I've dived under big mats of sargassum, mostly in the Gulf of Mexico, but also off the coast of Bermuda, as I'm sure many of you have as well, to look at the floating golden rainforest and the zoo of creatures who live there. Well, this is not the Sargasso Sea. <laughs> I want to stop the video there at this point. I forgot to say I'd like to stop the video at this point <laughs> <laughs> and just make a few comments, if we can. Thanks. 
So, with that as, as sort of the background, I hope that you do appreciate what an opportunity that you have in the midst of what may seem to be a daunting future. Well, it is a daunting future, but in spite of all the doom and gloom that is around us, that not just wars and famine and all the human issues that are certainly challenges for our time, as never before, because as never before on the planet, there have not been seven billion people that need to be supported with energy, with food, with all the things that people need to survive. Space, seven billion of us now on a planet that has stayed the same size for, well, at least a few billion years. Three and a half, four and a half. So, bad news comes all the time. We passed 400 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere just a few weeks ago. That was kind of a critical oh, threshold in the eyes of some. Is it a tipping point? Are we launched now on an unstoppable course toward a planet that gets increasingly unfriendly to us? Bad news about the West Antarctic ice shelf. Is it now launched on an unstop unstoppable plunge into the sea with increasing sea level rise and so many other things that are triggered by the melting of polar ice. Well, just crossing that threshold of seven billion people, even if each person replaces him or herself, uh, it's still a planet that is stressed by the sheer numbers of us. The CO2, the warming, the methane, the release of increasing greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, all these things, huh, and many others. The acidification of the ocean, things that the Challenger scientists, Beebe and Barton, <coughs> scientists through the 1990s did not have on their balance sheet as something to be concerned about. But now it's hot news. The chemistry of the planet is changing chemistry of the ocean is driving that change. Of course, the chemistry of the atmosphere, but chemistry of the atmosphere is driven by the nature of the ocean, now as it always has. Knowing that and understanding that is in itself something that is cause for hope. It's knowing, it's understanding the basic processes that give us a chance to make decisions going forward that are grounded increasingly on real knowledge of what's happening to the planet. If we didn't know, if we did not know, we'd be in serious trouble. Well, think about it. We're the only creatures on Earth, and not only that, we're the only humans ever to live who have the benefit of the knowledge you now have. You have the access to the Library of Congress in your pocket if you carry a little smartphone around with you. But even if you don't, you can go to a source of information, potentially the linking together of the seven billion minds that now exist, which in a way, well, on one hand, it's pretty scary to think seven billion people, well, how are we gonna deal with all these people? It's also an unprecedented opportunity. Never before could we know, could we know? We didn't have satellites up in the sky. We didn't have submersibles that can go deep into the sea. We didn't know huh, until right about now that the power that we use to take ourselves across the ocean could make any difference in terms of the sounds that go into the sea. I attended a conference in Germany, just a couple, few years ago, it was about five years ago, where the 
organizers of the conference started out by saying, shipping was the nature of the conference, about the nature of the, the greatest new technologies for powering our way around the ocean. And, but it started with, if we could go back 50 years knowing what we now know about noise, about fuel, about the ballast water that causes issues in the sea, what would we do differently? What decisions might we have made in terms of ship construction when it didn't seem to matter how much noise was created by these big propellers going through the ocean? Um, nobody cared much. And when fuel was cheap, the fact that you got less efficiency didn't seem to matter. Well, rising cost of fuel, efficiency, noise, oh, and ballast water. Oh, ships are now perversely designed so that it, they're required to take on water from one part of the planet and, and dump it out in another part of the planet. It's just, as from an engineer standpoint, hey, it's just water. It's just ballast. From a biologist standpoint, now we know you're taking parts of this living soup from one part of the planet and transporting it to another with consequences that now we have to face. But at least we know. At least we know. Going forward, perhaps ship design can reflect that knowledge. And that too was a part of this amazing conference that I attended as a biologist. I'm not a shipbuilder. <laughs> Nothing to do with ocean transport except as a witness. All of you, all of us, are witnesses across disciplines now that perhaps going back 50 years ago would not be as accessible. You can get some information, some taste of what others know in a great variety of disciplines and stuff it into your brain. And you can be a kind of ecologist, whether you call yourself that or not, but looking at the various interactions of the environment and how they, how they play uh, with whatever area of expertise you have to put it in the new knowledge base that we have to understand how one thing impacts another. So <laughs> every once in a while I'm asked to give a commencement address. And I find myself drawn to a theme. The theme being that if you have to choose a time to be born in all of history, whether any time in the past or any time in the future, just think about now as perhaps the sweet spot is never before armed with the distillation of what all preceding generations have been able to deliver one way or the other for us to take on and use at a time when, as never before, we need to know. We need to be able to look over the cliff and see if that's where we want to go. <laughs> or whether we want to lay a path for the future of humankind that is at least as prosperous as the past has been. It's there to be done. One of my heroes, maybe yours too, Ed Wilson, the ant man from Harvard, <laughs> has famously said on his 80th birthday that he has been witness to a time when we're letting nature slip through our fingers. But the real concern is that nature may let us slip through hers. Huh. But now we know. And in one of his recent books, Ed Wilson, and I've heard him say this recently at a talk that he gave at the National Geographic about a year ago, where he articulated basically the same concept. If you could be born anywhere in time, choose now. Choose now. Jackson Brown sings that in a song that he's about to release. On an, if you could be born, if I could be born, he says, anywhere in time, 
it would be now for a host of reasons. Perhaps the most important being that what we choose to do or fail to do in the next 10 years, when it's likely most of us, maybe all of us, will still be here to be a part of the action, the most important time in the next 10,000 years. This century is going to be a century of turmoil. It already is. But we could emerge, should emerge, with a better world than ever before. Because never before could we see that it's time to stop consuming the natural systems that keep us alive. Time to respect nature as the source of everything we care about. I have a particular perspective on life in the sea. A lot of people think of it as seafood. <laughs> Anything that swims, fair game. Huh. You see something you've never seen before, two questions arise in the minds of most. Is it going to eat me or can I eat it? <laughs> it's a very Neanderthal approach to life, other forms of life. Even people looking at other people. <laughs> But now we know what could not be known to our predecessors. We have to take care of the natural world. We have to take care of the living ocean as if our lives depend on it, because they do. And as one who served as the chief scientist of NOAA, where a big wedge of what NOAA does, aside from satellites and exploration and even a tiny little part of the program called the National Marine Sanctuary Program. Tundi knows all about how important that is. A lot of the rest of you do too. Yay, got to protect the ocean. <laughs> but only in very recent times has the idea of ocean, ocean protection seemed to be worth considering because the ocean, it seemed, was so big, so vast, so resilient. Nothing that humans could do could possibly alter its nature. Ocean was too big to fail. Huh. But now we know. We are seeing an ocean in turmoil. We're seeing declines in populations of ocean animals, ocean life, or some would say seafood creatures, that once were thought to be totally resilient, didn't matter how many we took, they'd always come back. Even our laws formed 50, 60 years ago, and policies, our ethic of taking from nature formed centuries ago. It's how we fed ourselves thousands of years ago. You just take from the natural systems. And unlike the animals and plants that we grow, we assign a dollar value to the land, and dollar value to every cow or chicken. Fish are free. Shrimp are free. Lobsters are free. They're just out there to be taken. And they will always come back because the ocean is so big, so vast. <laughs> and so in the 50s, in the 60s, the 70s, policies were put in place that govern our approach to the ocean. We're seeing it now begin with mining, deep sea mining. Oh, the ocean is so big doesn't matter how much we take. Oil and gas exploration, similarly. We're beginning to see the consequences of that way of thinking. Why do people think that way? Perhaps in part because from the surface, the ocean looks the same today, pretty much, as it did half a century or five centuries ago or 5,000 years ago. But getting under the surface, to get in the ocean, to see the ocean, as the creatures who live there see the ocean. That's new. You know what our predecessors could not know, could not see, could not evaluate. And so in our time, we're seeing this attitude of exploiting the ocean, taking from the ocean, persist despite the evidence that it can't work to take large quantities of ocean wildlife and still have an ocean that functions in a way that underpins matters such as 
generating oxygen, taking up carbon, having food webs and systems that support things of value more than just pounds of meat that we extract from the ocean. If I were the big boss of the world, <laughs> or maybe just of NOAA, I would urge a transformation of the National Marine Fisheries Service to the National Marine Fish Service, where the focus goes on, let's take care of life in the sea and recognize values that transcend what we can extract as pounds of meat or oil or food for cows and chickens and pigs or even the modest amount that people take to consume directly because all things considered, the most important thing that we extract from the ocean is life itself, our existence. And by extracting, using the techniques that we've been applying, whether it's oil and gas or mining, and certainly such things as long lining and trawling and other just amazingly destructive techniques that we didn't know it mattered. We didn't know that, it, that we could hurt the ocean. Now we know. But our policies haven't kept up with what we know. But you're here at a time when this avalanche of new information, new insight, new appreciation, new understanding of the value of the living ocean is finally coming into focus. That we have to protect big chunks of the ocean. And what's happening that you'll hear more about, about the Sargasso Sea, about the potential for nations coming together to protect something more valuable than anything we can take from the sea. It's protecting the ocean because it gives us life. Life. It's the living ocean that really matters. And you are witnesses. You have the power. I'd love to hear more about what you've been learning so I can incorporate that into my database. So I can be an ambassador for you as I learn more every day. And you should do the same thing. Never think that you're finished learning. That every step is the beginning of the next step, armed with the new knowledge that you gain. We just need to inform the policies with the knowledge that we now have and catch up, and catch up with new policies that reflect the urgency of taking care of the natural systems that take care of us. There's so much more I'd like to say. I would love to take all of you down in a submarine. I'd like to lift off right now, dive into the Sargasso Sea, go down and see where do those eels go anyway. <laughs> and just follow them as they travel back to their places of their ancestry and figure out how do they do this? How do they do this? Well, we're beginning to get some clues and what you're doing is so important to get out there hands on, flippers on, diving in, using your good minds, armed with the knowledge that is unprecedented, and adding to that knowledge base at this most critical point in time. Thank you.